Hello, everybody out there. Um, thank you for joining our informational webinar from the Encore STEM Teachers Program. My name is David Taust, and I am the uh, Northern California Program Director. Let me see if I can get my webcam working. So we can, uh, there we go. All right, so hello, everybody. Um, glad you could join us. Um, I don't know if you can see the webcam right now, but uh, I hope you can hear everything. If uh, you have a question at any point today, please use the uh, question uh, menu on the right-hand side of your screen, and you could also use a chat function if, uh, if that doesn't work. Um, but today what we're going to be doing is answering some of your questions about um, Encore and giving you an overview of our program and trying it as best we can to uh, let you know what the options are available to you with uh, our organization. Um, let me try one more thing, just so I am sure that we're able to uh, see one another, you, at least that you could see me. Um, oops. There we go. Well, maybe, maybe the webcam is not going to work, <laughs> which is too bad. Um, but a little bit of background on myself. Um, I was a former science teacher in Boston Public Schools and in um, San Francisco at a charter school network. And following that, I worked at a nonprofit that I co-founded for five years that uh, involved giving one-on-one -on -one tutoring to kids who can't afford it. Um, but coming into Encore, I think it's, it's a great combination of using my experience to help other people get involved in the teaching field. And um, I th uh, it's, it's a wonderful way to make sure that uh, there's high quality science and math educators moving moving forward, not just um, for, for me doing it, but uh, to help other people do it as well. Okay, so I'm going to re-show my screen, but before we continue, I also want to introduce uh, Bethany Orozco to you. She is my colleague who works out of Los Angeles, and she um, is joining us on the call and will be able to answer some questions as well. Um, so, Bethany, I'd, I'd love for you to just say hi to everybody if uh, you're able to unmute yourself and um, tell, tell everyone a little bit about your background and, and where you're coming from. Yeah. Um, thanks, David. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Yes. Wonderful. Um, yes. Yeah, so, um, I'm excited that um, all of you have decided to be on this webinar with us today. Um, we're excited to tell you more about Encore and answer any questions that you might have. And I'd love to do that specifically for Southern California um, uh, when we get to that point as well. Um, my background is also as a science and math teacher. Um, actually, when I was a college student, I volunteered in the Minneapolis Public Schools in Minnesota, a Midwestern um, gal. And um, I decided that I wanted to go into teaching because I saw just how behind my students were in um, math and science. So I taught um, math and science at the high school level here in Los Angeles. Um, I was also a recruiter with a charter school in the San Fernando Valley called the Puck Schools, and recently joined the Encore team as a Southern California Program and Recruitment Director. And I'll send it back to you, David, and I'm excited to um, talk to all of you today and also answer any questions you may have. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so the way we'll do this today is uh, our presentation is going to come in sections. And after the end of each section, if there's any questions that have appeared in the question box, we can address those at that time. Um, we can read the question, give our uh, best answer, and then unmute you if you're the asker of the question to see if you have other um, follow-up questions or if we clarified everything you needed to clarify. I hope that sounds great. Um, hopefully, I, I believe you can see our first slide and introduction to Encore on your screen, and, and we can get going. OK, so thank you for joining us today. Um, if you're here, you probably know a little bit about Encore, but uh, just by way of uh, general introduction, the Encore Teachers Program is a nonprofit, and we exist in California only right now. And our purpose is to help people who are in their uh, professional careers working in science, math, technology, engineering, um, and in uh, in education circles, we abbreviate that as STEM. So if you're a STEM professional and you have a curiosity about education and you've always said to yourself, gosh, I always thought about teaching and, and for one reason or another that might have not 
come to pass, um, our nonprofit exists to help you get involved in teaching and in education. Um, that can happen in many different ways, and we'll talk about that um, a little bit later on, but it's not required that everyone up front knows that they want to be a teacher. It's enough to know that you're interested in exploring education and interested in working with students. Um, there's a great need for teachers right now, and in 2010, uh, President Obama said that uh, we need 100,000 new qualified math and science teachers by the year 2020. And that's no small feat, so we're doing our part to increase the number of math and science teachers out there. Uh, there's a demand that has remained pretty consistent um, and will remain very consistent over the next couple of years for math and science teachers. A lot of people ask, uh, is this something that uh, is, you know, will there be jobs out there for me? And the answer is yes, there will be jobs. Um, the math and science as well as special education areas of teaching are what are determined to be uh, high need areas. Um, and more often than not, a lot of teachers um, that go into teaching are interested in the humanities, in, in history, and in, in English. Um, but there's, there's a lot more opportunity out there for folks in technical fields, math and science, um, to become uh, part-time or full-time teachers. Uh, the reason there's a consistency there is um, even with the fluctuations in um, open positions that, that may decrease, um, there's a lot of people that are retiring. Uh, the baby boomer generation is retiring from teaching, and that causes um, a pretty consistent demand and need for new teachers to come into the profession. Um, so why is there a need for such high-quality teachers? Well, there is um, a problem right now, and, and this graph depicts some um, statistics on achievement levels of students that um, take the California skills test. This is from a couple years back. Um, the CST, the California skills test, is a mandatory test that all public school students in California take. And the numbers you see there um, on the graph are the percentage of students that measure proficient at certain grade levels and certain topics. So the CST right now is not, or actually been discontinued in favor of another test with Common Core. But um, you can see that at best, you're looking at 35% of, of uh, high school students taking a test uh, at a certain grade level in a certain area are, being, are scoring proficient. Um, and that means, of course, that 65% are not proficient at uh, basic math. And so when you look at, you know, the grade 11, and you see that 34, 35 percent of um, students at grade 11 are proficient at Algebra 1, you have to scratch your head and, and wonder what's going on and can I do something about it. This uh, gets a little bit more serious when you disaggregate the data by uh, socioeconomic status. So in this graph, you have the same data set that is now separated by whether or not a student has uh, qualifies for free and reduced lunch. That's what FRL stands for. And you can see here that there is a gap between the students who qualify for free and reduced lunch and the students that do not. Um, this is what is known um, really uh, broadly as the achievement gap. And that is a phrase that you may have heard uh, elsewhere. But in short, it means that there are differences between uh, well-to-do students and students who are financially stable and students who are low income in terms of their achievement. Um, and this one factor correlates very highly with uh, and predicts to a, a large degree whether a student's going to be successful in school. Um, it, it isn't limited just to socioeconomic status. You see on this graph that race also plays a factor in um, a student's uh, overall achievement or can play a factor. Statistically, over uh, large groups of people, we see trends that are, to me, very disturbing um, in that uh, white students will be achieving uh, at a much higher level than Hispanic students and African American students. Uh, the big point here is that students in California are not doing well in math and science, and frighteningly so. They need help. And this is especially true of low-income students and of ethnic and racial minorities. Now, this is something that um, the Encore STEM Teachers Program tries to address head-on. We place all of our uh, 
candidates and eventual educators in what we call high needs schools. And, and the determination for that is that a certain percentage of students at that school qualify for free and reduced lunch. Um, we believe that education is an act of social justice and that in order to make education more equitable, we need to allocate lots of resources to uh, the folks that might not be getting as many resources right now. So this is a big problem. Here's why. Number one, the jobs of tomorrow are going to involve a lot of science and math. And there's a lot of uh, statistics out there saying that, you know, 70%, I think I heard this uh, recently, 70% of the jobs that will be um, most popular in 10 years don't exist right now. And a lot of those jobs are in technical fields. They require technical knowledge. And on an individual basis, if a student is graduating high school with a shaky foundation in science and math, they will not be career ready. Um, and in order to make sure that their options in life are not limited, we need to make sure that they have uh, at least a basic proficiency in science and math. Second, looking at society at large, um, a lot of innovation uh, that drives economic forces is based on science and math. And without sounding too doomsday or too drastic about it, I, I do firmly believe that if we uh, lose our edge in science and math fields, um, as a society, society will stop working the way it does now. And it's important to perpetuate and continue the thinking and the work that uh, has been going on for generations around science and math in order to maintain a lot of the things that we enjoy um, today. And lastly, um, the problems that are mounting in the world um, are getting bigger in many ways, and there's lots of ways to solve those problems, but I think that by far the best way to solve these problems is by using science and math know-how. And if we do not equip the next generation with those skills and those competencies, they are really missing out on their best chance to solve really critical issues such as global warming and climate change. So this is part of why we believe very strongly that it's a, uh, an imperative that students are educated well in the STEM fields. So what is the best way forward? That's a very big question, and I think that if anyone had an answer to that, um, they'd win lots of prizes and, and uh, lots of money. But uh, the uh, federal government came out with a, a five-step strategic plan uh, in 2013, and I highlighted three of these items in red on the slide that you're seeing. Um, the first one, it says, improve STEM instruction and prepare 100,000 excellent new K-12 uh, STEM teachers by 2020. We talked about that. Number two is increase and sustain public engagement in youth in science and technology and math. Um, and they say we want to support a 50% increase in the number of U.S. youth who have an authentic STEM experience each year prior to completing high school. An authentic STEM experience. And to me, this means they need to answer the question of relevance for students. You often hear, why do I have to know this, or why is this important to me? And it's very uh, crucial that that question gets answered, maybe not um, outside of school as much as in school every day where kids are sitting in classrooms. Um, and number four, they say we need to better serve groups historically underrepresented in STEM fields. Um, increasing the number of students from groups that have been underrepresented in STEM fields that graduate with STEM degrees in the next 10 years and improve women's participation in the areas of STEM where they are significantly underrepresented. Um, I highlighted numbers 1, 2, and 4 here because these are the initiatives that can happen at the middle and high school level. Um, the other two initiatives have to do with uh, what happens after high school, in college and beyond. Um, and while that is very important, that's, that's really not part of our purview. So we are trying hard to focus on um, what, uh, what is going on uh, in the secondary realm and uh, in the middle school realm as well. Um, so of those three things that are highlighted, we at Encore have developed a solution. What is that solution? Our solution is that we need to take people out of um, industry and out of professions that have to do with science, math, technology, and engineering, and we have to get those people working with students. Now, why is that true? Well, we believe that STEM professionals know their stuff. I think um, it goes without saying that if you're a professional chemist or you're a professional engineer, 
you are very well versed in the content of your craft. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of times, teachers are you know going into teach chemistry or physics without having you know even an undergraduate degree in that topic. But we can count on a career engineer to know a lot about engineering. We also think that STEM professionals uh, such as yourselves are passionate about your area of expertise. You can also speak about why it matters and why it's relevant. Um, this is really important because a lot of students find that their learning experience is very abstract. They study math and they don't know what it's good for and why you use it. But uh, to have a professional come in and say, well, here is why you're learning derivatives, or here is why you're learning trigonometry, and here is how it's used, and here is the problems it can solve, um, it gives them a foundation and a, a context to place their knowledge in, and they say, wow, you know, oh, that's why I need to know this. Otherwise, it's a very difficult um, thing to wrap their head around. Uh, we also think that STEM professionals can serve as role models for students, and this is important. Um, because a lot of students, especially from under-resourced uh, backgrounds, may never have met an engineer or may never have met someone that has an advanced degree and think to themselves, that's another world, that's not for me. That's something that I really can't touch. And that's really unfortunate. That's not true at all. And we think that by placing students in contact with professionals, we can alleviate some of that misconception. Um, and following from that, we think that... Um, STEM professionals have uh, access to worlds, opportunities, resources, and uh, networks that students might not have. And it's a very powerful thing to say, you know, when I worked at my company before this, we did X, Y, and Z. Oh, and by the way, we can go take a field trip and see what it's like there in the lab or in the, um, in the shop. Um, that really grounds the learning for uh, a lot of the students, and in many ways, it's only possible uh, when you have prior professional experience. Both Bethany and I uh, were educators as our first career, and because of that, we weren't able to access some of the things that uh, professionals coming out of industry are able to access. So we really do believe that in order to solve a lot of these problems in, in science and math education, the best way to do it is to get people from professions into classrooms and working directly with students. Uh, before we go on, I see we have a question um, from a DT that says, out of 100,000 teachers, how many teachers are needed in California? Um, that's a very good question. I, I don't off the top of my head know, but I know it's not 100,000 divided by 50. I think uh, California being one of the larger states population-wise and having a, a lot of high-needs um, students uh, living here, um, the number is, is pretty high. So high, in fact, that I'm not as uh, worried about wondering whether or not there will be jobs. Um, because even right now, I'm getting, and I'm sure Bethany is also getting, a lot of um, uh, a lot of requests from school districts and from charter school networks saying, "Hey, do you have any math people? Do you have any physics people? Can you send them our way?" Um, so I'm sorry, I can't give you a exact number, but um, I, I think that uh, it's it's something that shouldn't be uh, worried about too much in terms of the uh, demand side of things. Uh, Bethany, I'm not sure if, if you have more uh, accurate uh, quantitative numbers or statistics at all, um, but if you do uh, or are able to share any, any thoughts on that, please feel free. Yeah, um, well, I think in the, in the graph that we saw earlier, um, in 2008, there was a study that we would need 33,000 teachers in California alone um, over the next 10 years, and I think that that still stands. Um, and just like you, David, I've gotten several phone calls and emails from principals and districts um, already in January and February recruiting for their science and math and engineering teachers for next fall. So there is no um, shortage of opportunity for science and math teachers. Great. Thank you. Um, Aditi, I'm going to unmute you really quickly and ask if uh, you have any follow-up questions or you're wondering anything else about that. No, thanks. That was all. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay, so forging onward, um, we, uh, as an organization, position ourselves in between uh, STEM professionals and teaching professionals. And our hope is that we become the bridge between a STEM professional wondering, how do I get involved in teaching and education? 
and um, actually doing that, teaching in a classroom. Um, this is something that a lot of people have done before. I think to date, since the inception of Encore, we've had about 350 people uh, make a, a change in their career in some way, shape, or form and uh, get more involved in education. So here you can see some of our Encore educators. These are people who used to work in industry, and uh, you can see what they used to do, and now they are all uh, teachers. And I believe this group is all high school teachers. Um, I should say that Encore serves folks who are interested in middle school and high school, so um, it's not limited to 9th through 12th. If you like working with 6th, 7th, and 8th graders, that's, that's definitely something you can do. There's a web link right here, and we're not going to do it, we're not going to click on that right now, but if you wanted to hear a little bit from some of our educators about their experience, I encourage you to copy this web link down and uh, watch it on YouTube at a later date. It's a, probably a three-minute video that um, interviews some of our educators and asks them, you know, what, what are you getting out of this experience? It's, um, I think, pretty cool. So I encourage you to uh, copy that web link down, and, and I give you a couple seconds to copy and paste onto your notepad or um, however you want to do that. Okay. If anyone, by the way, needs a copy of this presentation afterwards um, or wants to watch it again, we are recording it. And if you email me, david at encore.org, I can send you a PDF copy of all of our slides. Okay, moving on. So some uh, statistics about our educators uh, you can find here. We are split pretty evenly between math and science. Um, as well as in Northern and Southern California. The regions that we serve include the Bay Area, Sacramento, LA County, Orange County, and San Diego. That's currently uh, where we're located, and unfortunately, if you live outside of those regions, we might not be able to work with you just yet, and we're working on expanding our, our service region, but as of now, those are the areas we cover. Um, the people that come to us are coming from industries um, that's you may uh, also come from. You can see that in the green bar graph below. There are a bunch of um, people who are coming with advanced degrees, 71%. Average uh, people have masters and uh, PhDs. And there's an average of 17 years of industry experience. Um, to date, we estimate that about 10,000 children in California have been in some way touched by an Encore educator and have been uh, helped out by one of our people. And that's that's a great number, but we aspire to actually uh, multiply that by 10 and over the next uh, several years get up to 100,000 children. Um, and here again is a great uh, statistic that Bethany quoted, 33,000 uh, folks that are still needed by 2017 in California. Okay, so once uh, people are in Encore, what are, what are they getting from us? What exactly do we offer people? <clears throat> the first thing we offer is a chance to try out education. This is something that is, uh, that is uh, sometimes misunderstood by people who are just starting out, and we really want to make sure that as people get involved in education, they have a chance to try before they buy, so to speak. Um, and make sure that this is something they really want to be doing. So in order to do that, we give people access to students in um, three contexts. One is uh, a tutoring placement, and I'm sure you all have a great idea as to what tutoring is. Um, the second is we, we place people in real classrooms, and we have them observe and help teachers out. And then the third thing is um, we give them an opportunity, if they want, to, to create their own curriculum, teach their own class, and um, really try out you know, what that feels like on a smaller scale with a smaller group of kids with a lot of support around the curriculum and around the instruction. Um, so we call that our volunteer pre-service placements, and those are the first two bullet points. Um, this, the, the next thing we do is we are uh, able to give people a lot of advising and guidance around uh, applying to teaching credential programs, and that includes navigating financial aid and scholarships. We ourselves, unfortunately, don't have enough money to support um, people financially, 
Uh, we can't subsidize people's uh, credentialing programs, but we do have information that will help people apply for scholarships and take out uh, educational loans and things of that nature. So we uh, we give a lot of advising around that. We also have a comprehensive list of all the credentialing programs that are available to you, and we can help you um, make those choices. The uh, next thing we do is we support people around the CSET, and that is the test that uh, demonstrates your subject expertise. Um, these tests, uh, some people say, are not very easy, and they take a little bit of studying and brushing up, especially if you haven't taken a standardized test in a while. Um, and so we provide study guides for that, and we're able to organize study groups if people are interested in, in uh, brushing up for their CSET. Um, one of the things that the people on board really appreciate, and maybe the most, is that once they're ready to start finding jobs, one of the things we do is we help with uh, networking and uh, placement. So we have a lot of good contacts in our regions, and we are happy and able to connect people with the hiring departments of districts and charter networks as people seek full-time employment. Um, we offer ongoing professional development, and we usually do that um, through uh, a variety of ways. The, the first is our fall, spring, and summer institutes, and these are in-person gatherings where we get um, educators from different cohorts and different stages in their careers meeting together and working on um, topics that are relevant to the teaching practice and uh, things of that nature. I have a slide coming up that will tell you more about that. Um, we also are going to be organizing less formal and more frequent professional development events, both in-person, uh, meetup style, and also online that would happen throughout the year. Um, and something I think that is really important is we offer people a cohort of uh, professionals who are really going through the same thing that you are. Um, they're interested in education. They're trying it out. They're volunteering. They're thinking about becoming teachers. They're changing careers. And it's very nice to have a, uh, a cohort of people and some peers to talk about this process with. Um, I found that when I was in graduate school training to be a teacher, one of the most valuable things I had was my cohort. And we could you know, go out to dinner after class or after student teaching and talk about what happened and even complain about our professors and commiserate and uh, share notes and trade lessons and things like that. So it's a very valuable thing. Um, so we offer all of this to our educators free of charge. Uh, we do not charge for any of this. And the reason is because we, can, um, we are funded by uh, private donations, grants, and um, philanthropic foundations and corporate donations as well. So all of this is free of charge, but we do need to make sure that anyone who's on board is able to uh, and ready to use the resources available to them. OK, let me uh, pause right here and see if there are any questions. It looks like, as of right now, there are no further questions. OK. Um, so let me continue talking about some of, uh, some of the aspects of this career pathway we're placing people on. Um, our volunteer placement, this happens um, as one of the first things people get involved with. Uh, we will track people into one of three tiers of volunteering, tutoring, guest teaching, and curriculum-based teaching. And, and I spoke briefly about each of these tiers previously. Um, it, it's going to be up to each individual person to decide what tier they want to try out first. And I would and Bethany would work with each individual person to kind of select a tier that's most appropriate to what they're coming in with and what their, their objectives are. Um, and I think you can think of it from least intense to most intense in terms of tutoring is the least intense, guest teaching is second, and then curriculum-based teaching is, is the most intense. One great thing about the volunteer placements is that people often find that when they are volunteering, they're also meeting meeting people. They're meeting teachers, they're meeting principals, they're meeting HR directors, and quite often when it's time to look for jobs, people can go back to the place they volunteered and say, hey, remember me, and uh, I love working here, I'd love to you know, come on as a full-time teacher, and those will often turn into um, uh, hiring, uh, being hired and, and being full-time employees. So that's, that's a great thing. Okay, next slide. So some of the placement partners in uh, Northern California, you can see on this list, there are school districts, there are after-school programs, there are charter schools, um, there are 
a, a wide variety of places and locations. And what we do is we aim to make sure that something near to you is available. Um, and we're, we're still building up our menu and our list of placement sites. So um, this is not exhaustive, but it gives you an idea and a flavor of where we're looking uh, to work and place people. We also have a lot of places in Southern California. In Southern California. And um, again, this is not an exhaustive list, but uh, it should give you an idea as to where our folks are being placed. With all of our placements, we make sure that people are being placed with uh, experienced teachers who have signed on and agreed to also uh, give feedback and some mentoring and engage in discussion with all of our volunteers in order to answer questions, um, make sure that people are well equipped to work in that environment, um, and generally make sure that people have a good experience. And the trade-off is great. I mean, the Encore folks that go in get a great, valuable, intrinsically fun experience of working with students, and they learn a lot about what it's like on the ground. And then our placement partners are really enthusiastic to work with us, too, because they get um, help from content experts who can come in and uh, not only help people out with their math, their chemistry, their biology, their engineering project, but also you know, say, well, here's how this is useful, and here's why I am engaged in this work. Um, professional development events that we talked about previously, um, and that includes the institutes as well as the smaller um, events, will cover topics that are really relevant to, to you and practically and immediately useful. So some of the topics that we talk about, um, you can see here on the left, a lot of the topics are, a, um, are targeted towards people who are changing their careers and who may not have a second skill set. Um, we talk about there being two important skill sets in teaching. The first is the content knowledge, which you, <coughs> excuse me, which you all have from your industries. <coughs> excuse me. The second is the how to teach skills, the pedagogy, the instruction, the classroom management, the lesson planning, um, things like that. And we focus a lot on all of those um, topics in our trainings. Um, in addition to the um, professional development, we have a lot of social opportunities for training and support and growth. The Encore directors, being myself and Bethany, having been former teachers, are available to you um, really at any time to answer questions that you have and work with you on various aspects of, of your teaching. Um, and we encourage people to take uh, a, a really good advantage of the cohort that they're in and the other Encore educators. Uh, we believe that everyone has something to offer and there's a lot of things that you can learn from your fellow um, core members. Um, okay, I'm going to pause there for a minute and I see we have a question. And I can't make the box big, but let me try. If I already have teaching experience, is the volunteer placement mandatory? Um, this is a question from Peter. Uh, the answer is yes, it is mandatory. Um, and there's a couple reasons for that. The first is that uh, we, not, we aren't exactly sure where and how the teaching experience that you previously have had looks like. Um, and it may be in an environment that doesn't correlate with uh, the places and the uh, schools and the types of uh, uh, communities that we're hoping to place people in later on. Um, we also don't know what sort of training was involved in that teaching experience. So uh, in order to make sure that we're giving everyone a really uh, good uh, first-hand view on what it's like, we do require that people go through it. Um, we also believe that it's important to do some volunteering and to give back. And so um, we will not, unfortunately, count any experience that people have as paid tutors if they're doing that on the side. Um, but uh, we want to make sure that there is an, an element of service that's involved here, too. Um, I should say, we're going to get to this a little bit later, too, that if you already have a teaching credential and you have classroom experience, then this program might not be the best fit for you. Um, we need to make sure that we're, we're helping people who have you know, less experience, who are curious about what's going on, um, and have to uh, you know, want to try it out for the first time in order to um, get going and really make a, a change in their career. 
Um, so Peter, let me unmute you for just a second to make sure you don't have any follow-up questions or if I've answered that thoroughly. In regards to uh, the professionals that come in, do you have an approximate how many actually stay in the program versus those that come in and say, oops, this is not what I'm cut out for? <laughs> yes. Um, yes, we do. So there's, uh, there's been a recent change in our program model, so it might not be as relevant to talk about what previously was done. And the next slide is going to give you an idea as to how you can come in not being sure about whether or not you want to become a teacher and still have that be okay. Um, so maybe the next slide will shed some light on that. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, let me let me show you that, and then if you have any follow-up questions, we can address those. Sounds sounds okay? Fantastic, thank you. Great, thanks. Um, Bethany, is there anything else you want to add in terms of services that we provide for our educators? Yeah, um, so David, I would just um, comment on um, kind of what you were saying about if you already have teaching and tutoring experience. Um, I will say that... Um, you know, if people already have a lot of experience with um, the student population and age um, and type of school that they might be placed at, um, then you might fall into a different sort of starting point, whether that's tutoring or guest teaching. So we have had people that have skipped over the tutoring piece of our program because they have done a lot of work with students of that age and background. Um, so I just want to mention that as well. Yes, no, that's a very good point. Uh, we can ramp people up quicker or slower depending on how comfortable they're feeling and the experiences that they are. Um, coming in with previously. Okay, so the next slide gives you an idea of what we, we are now using as our program model. This is actually something we've adopted um, only this, this calendar year, um, and, and we've changed things up. It used to be that we accepted people on a rolling admissions basis, and now for a variety of reasons, we're accepting people um, throughout a recruiting season and then starting everyone all at once as a cohort all together. So this is the trajectory that people can go on once they are involved in Encore. Um, right now, uh, we would consider people to be in a recruitment phase uh, where they're thinking about applying and going through interviews, and we'll talk about you know, the specifics of that later. Um, if people are accepted, we expect that they participate in our summer regional institute, or summer residential institute, and we used to call that boot camp, but we're calling it the SRI, the Summer Residential Institute now. Um, and that's an orientation. You get to know the people in the cohort. You get to um, have a better sense of the options in terms of placement, the pathways forward, things like that. Um, in that uh, initial orientation, we will ask people for placement preferences and then over the summer, make placements um, and partnerships with some of our, our schools and our after-school programs so that when the school year starts in the fall, you're off and running um, from even the first week of school. And uh, we expect right now that uh, the, the time obligation is about uh, once a week at minimum, and it lasts through the whole semester. And obviously, for school breaks and weeks, school is off like Thanksgiving. You're not expected to be there. But uh, once a week, lasting through the whole semester, with the ultimate goal being you know, getting a flavor of what it's really like on the ground. So in the first year, we ask people, um, what do you think? Is this something you really like? Is this something you want to continue with? Are you comfortable or where you're at? You know, how does this sit with you? And there can be one of three answers. The first answer is um, the first uh, track on the bottom in blue you see. Um, people might say, gosh, I think this is great. I really enjoy where I'm at. The volunteering is really meaningful, but I'm not ready to become a teacher. And we say, great. I think that makes a lot of sense. You know, For whatever reason, um, it's not the right time or it's not the right fit, but there's still something really intrinsically valuable about you having um, this experience working with kids. So what we'll ask is that you continue to volunteer um, at a once a week level. And we can find volunteer placements that are compatible with full-time work schedules. So um, for the rest of the, the time with Encore, which is a two-year commitment we're asking, people will continue to volunteer 
uh, at least once a week. We call that STEM expert or STEM X tutoring. The second track, and the, the next two tracks are for people who say, wow, this is great. I'm ready to take the next step. Um, the first step they could say is, I want to teach, and I want to teach now. <laughs> and they get very um, anxious and excited, and, and they're chomping at the bit, and they're ready to go. And that would be the track on top. The red box uh, says CTE credential program. CTE stands for Career and Technical Education. This is a newer credential program and a, and a path towards full-time teaching that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but with this CTE credential program, you would apply in the fall. You would take your credentialing either online or in person at an extension school over the spring, and that is compatible with full-time work. Um, we expect during the spring that you would either engage in guest teaching or curriculum-based teaching, and the reason for that is that CTE credential programs don't have a student teaching component right now, and we want to make sure that that really valuable experience is had. So in the spring, um, you would continue to volunteer in one of those capacities, take all of your classes, and then at the end of the first year, you would actually be ready to start teaching, and you could be hired as a career and technical education teacher at the start of year two. Um, the third path is the middle path, and you see that in yellow. Um, in the fall, if you say, well, I, would, I do want to be a teacher, and I want to be a single subject teacher. Single subject means the traditional core content areas like algebra or biology or physics. Um, applying to these credentialing programs, which tend to be a little bit more traditional, takes longer. Um, it's kind of like applying to graduate school. There are letters of recommendation, there are personal statements, there are transcripts, there are uh, things like that. And by and large, all of those applications are due sometime between December 1st and March 1st. And decisions are given, and people start those programs either in the summer of their second year or in the fall of their second year. So um, for those folks in, in this track, the whole second year is taken up by their credential program. We don't expect that people also volunteer on top of this because they're going to be doing their student teaching. So in terms of the encore obligations, we're very hands-off, and we just say, please, uh, you know, dig into your credential program. But when you're ready to talk about finding jobs, let's talk about that and we can help you with placement. For those folks, um, they should be ready to teach by the end of their second year, and they should have their credential, and they're off and running at the start of year three, and um, they will then be classroom teachers in, in single subject areas. So in that way, even if you're coming in not sure and you decide in the middle, gosh, you know, I don't know if I'm going to teach, and in fact, I don't really want to make the full leap, but I still want to be involved, there still is a way to do it. Um, so, Peter, I want to unmute you really quick and make sure that I answered your question, your follow-up question, satisfactorily. Yeah, actually, this particular slide really clarifies uh, my other questions, too. So, great. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, let's forge onward. And, again, if there's other questions, just uh, let us know with the question box. Oh, I see one other question here. Um, the question is, is the Compton Unified School District part of the Los Angeles County School District assisted by Encore? Um, Bethany, because that's down in your part of the world, um, I might have you answer that. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, yes, we actually have worked with um, Compton. In fact, we have an engineering uh, teacher in Compton who is um, waiting for us to place an Encore educator <laughs> to volunteer in his classroom. He's very excited. So, um, yes, we do also serve Compton Unified. Great. Um, Alex, I want to unmute you and make sure that um, your question was answered or if you have any follow-ups. Hi there. Um, yes, uh, no, no follow-ups. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I am a graduate from a lot of the schools in this Compton Unified School District, and I've always, well, I've, in my experience, I've seen that it's been underserved, so I was curious if Encore would be a good route to try to help my own community, since I'm, I am, coincidentally, a, an engineering major, um, and recently I've gotten an MBA, so that might kind of benefit that district as well. So thank you for answering that. Yeah, thank you. I, that's awesome. Um, and I would encourage you to talk to Bethany, and she could help you get set up. Um, okay, I see another question here. Is this program for folks like myself who are interested in public service 
but not interested in a career change in the education? Um, that's a good question. I think that uh, it's appropriate to be involved in Encore if you're interested in volunteering with students. And I think what I would ask is, as you volunteer, keep an open mind. You know, if you know from the outset that this is definitely not something you want to do, you don't want to become a full-time teacher, but you are interested in volunteering, Encore is one way to do that. And of course, we have the option to get more involved later. Um, but I should also say, and uh, this obviously isn't a great way to sell our program, but there is a lot, there are a lot of uh, opportunities to volunteer in schools um, outside of Encore, and it could be that one of those uh, volunteer opportunities is um, is a better fit for you. What I do know is that for us internally, there's a lot of training and a lot of support, and um, if you know, for example, you go to a school district and say, "Hey, I want to volunteer." By and large, there's a cursory orientation, and then you're in there with the teacher, and sometimes you're thinking, oh, man, how, what am I doing? I don't know what's going on. Um, that doesn't happen with Encore. We have a lot of support around um, you know, what to expect in a classroom, strategies to work with students, uh, things of that nature. So, um, Igor, I'm, I'm going to unmute you and see if you have any follow-up questions. Uh, no, I think that answers it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, all right, we have another question here. It says, it's been my experience of seeing students getting left behind in math education because it builds on itself. My interest is to work with students that have fallen behind, thus believing math is demonic, so to speak, because they get lost along the way. Do you have classrooms to deal with these students? Um, the answer is, uh, we do. And I think a lot of the schools and the districts we work with, unfortunately, um, a lot of the students in these schools and districts are in that situation. Um, and that really is, is, it speaks nicely to the need and the problem at large that we're trying to solve by taking um, content experts and professionals in STEM and placing them with, te with these sorts of students. So you've, you've hit the nail on the head. And um, Doris, I'm going to unmute you if you have any follow-up or clarifying questions. Yes, I think you answered me pretty well. I just want to be with students. It's not the, the students that know the subject, they get it, they don't need the teacher. But you've got students in the classroom, they all get left behind, mm -hmm. and then they don't know what's going on, and that's the students that I want to work with. Yes. Well, those are the students we'd love for you to work with. That's, I think we're on the same page with that. So thank you. Um, okay, there's a bunch of other questions coming in right now, and they're about credentialing. So let me um, answer those after we talk a little bit more about credentials, um, and uh, maybe along the way those will get answered. Okay, so one of the things that Encore does is give people guidance with credentialing programs. There are a huge range of programs to choose from, um, and a lot of these programs happen at colleges and universities. There are um, a, a range of costs as well, and I think some of the more expensive programs, like uh, Stanford's, can run upwards of you know sixty thousand dollars for the program. And there's other programs that um, can be free if you pledge to give certain number of years of teaching once you're done to a school district. So. Um, there's a huge range. We can't speak monolithically about all of them, but um, we have a lot of research that we've put together on each of the programs that are available to people, um, and that includes their cost. Um, if you're anxious in finding out about one specific program, you can go to their website, and they'll usually have um, cost information there. Um, but we support both single subject and CTE credentials. Um, and we talked a little bit about the difference between the two, but I think it's worth delving more into what a CTE credential is. So as I said before, career in technical education is a new track, and this is something that is um, still less known and maybe even less understood as the traditional single subject track, but what CTE aims to do is to prepare students to be career, college, and community ready. Um, and so these are courses that are taught as electives, and they are courses that are given um, a lot of uh, giving students a lot of real world experience. Um, they are organized into industry sectors, and those industry sectors are actually mapped onto um, 
industries out there that uh, you know we need people to be moving into. Um, there are 15 of them total. Encore supports eight of these industry tracks, and that's because the other ones aren't as focused on math and science. Um, so these courses are taught as electives right now, uh, but there's a lot of energy and a lot of interest by a lot of schools and districts around making CTE and this sort of what they call linked learning experience standard for all high school students. Um, I know, for example, Oakland Unified is pledging to get every single student in Oakland Unified on a CTE track in the next five years. Um, but their problem is, wow, we don't have any CTE teachers to fill all that demand. So they are really interested in finding people who have um, a CTE credential. Now this is especially valuable uh, or salient for people like yourselves who are coming out of industry because one of the requirements is that you have professional experience. Um, the track for the credentialing requires this and, and you know, giving um, a credentialing organization um, your resume will basically say, okay, here is someone who has worked for five years in engineering and three years in energy, and yes, they are qualified to teach that. Um, and you don't have to take the CSET. You just have to have the work experience. Um, it's also a very quick track comparatively. Um, this can be done in, in as few as 15 weeks of online courses for a cost of, I think, $1,800. Um, and that's one example of, of a credentialing partner that we work with out of Orange County. Um, and the other one that I know of is in Berkeley Extension um, in, in Berkeley, California. And it's a little bit longer, but it's still affordable, and it still can happen alongside of uh, any job that you might hold. Um, one thing to note about CTE is that if you have a CTE credential, that is completely separate from a single subject credential. And you cannot teach a regular single subject class with a CTE credential, such uh, uh, like algebra. Um, but the opposite is also true. So if you have your single subject and you want to teach engineering, you can't do it with your math credential. You need a CTE credential to do it. So here are the subjects and the CTE areas that we support at Encore. Um, you'll recognize the single subject. Foundational means um, middle school, largely. Um, and then on the CTE side, these are the industry sectors that, <coughs> that we support our folks in going into. So if you're looking at that and saying, wow, you know, I worked in finance for, for 10 years and that would be perfect, um, you know, that's one path that you could go. Uh, the same for, for any of those, energy, engineering. Engineering seems to be pretty popular, um, as does uh, manufacturing. Oops. Okay, so we're going to back up, and I know there's some questions about credentialing, so let me address some of those. Um, one question is, what is the cost of credentialing? I talked about that briefly. It varies widely, um, and you know, it could be free, and it could be $60,000. Um, and it really depends on the, the credentialing program that you're going into. Uh, the CSUs tend to be cheaper, um, or more affordable, I should say, um, than the private schools. And uh, a lot of it will also come down to what scholarships are available. Um, there are federal grants and loans that are available to people as well as scholarships specific to each individual school. So it's really hard to speak broadly about that, but uh, I guess I, I, yeah, I would just say that there are a lot of, uh, lot of different price points that come in as well as different ways to uh, get that subsidized. So uh, Aditi, I will unmute you to see if you have any other questions about that. No, I think uh once I decide on what CTE I want to do, um, at that point, I will come with more questions. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I will say that the CTE pathway is uh, much more affordable. Um, another question that came in is, uh, does it take one year to complete a single subject credential? Uh, the answer is that is standard, yes. It's usually one year and one summer. Um, there are a couple programs that do it shorter, and there is one program I know that does it longer, which is a, a Berkeley, UC Berkeley program. So um, it really depends on the program, but the general um, length of time is a year in a summer, so one calendar year. Uh, Valerie, I'm going to unmute you, see if you have any follow-up questions for that. 
Hello, Valerie? Okay. Well, I hope, I hope the question was answered. Um, so the next question that's come in, it says, if you are a credentialed teacher, is it generally accepted to be part-time? For me, I could imagine wanting to be full-time at first, but later in life, I might want to have more of a gradual retirement. Um, this is possible, and I think the, um, the way to go about this most effectively is through CTE. Um, for whatever reason, I think that the CTE teachers are being hired part-time um, in greater quantity than the single-subject teachers. But um, there are situations that uh, occur regularly where you know people go part-time or people go half-time or three-quarter time, and uh, that really is handled case by case and is negotiated with um, HR departments at certain schools. Uh, Bill, I'll unmute you to see if you have any uh, follow-up questions or if I've answered that okay for you. No, fantastic, and uh, exactly the sort of thing I was hoping to hear. Thanks. Okay, thank you. All right, we got five minutes left, so I'm going I'm to keep pushing here. Um, so how do you get involved? Well, the first thing is to make sure that you meet our baseline criteria for selection. So one of them is that you live in an area that Encore serves, and we talked about our regions. Another is that you've worked in a STEM profession for at least three years of full-time work, and we take that from the CTE requirement. Another is that you're fully eligible to work in the U.S., and that means you're either a citizen, a permanent resident, or you have a work visa. Um, we need you to hold an undergraduate degree with at least a 2.5 GPA. And the reason of that for that is that the credentialing programs have that as a base requirement. Um, some, pe some credentialing programs have a higher GPA requirement, depending. And we also want to make sure that you don't already hold a credential. Um, and that's because if you already have that, then you're past the point of what we're able to do for you. So we want people that are a little bit more fresh out of uh, their jobs. If you meet those criteria and you're still interested, we really hope that you get involved. And the way to do that is to apply online. Um, and the link right here, um, you could go to Encore.org, and there's a big yellow button that says Apply Now. You could also uh, click this direct link to take, be taken to our application. And this is how we process all of the interested <coughs> folks. Um, it's a very straightforward online application. I should warn you, there are five short answer questions where it's not just putting in your contact info, but we want to hear some of your thoughts about um, you know, where you're at with this process and, and what you think about certain aspects of teaching and education. So be ready for some, some short answer questions. Uh, but as soon as you submit that application, we can really get going. Um, if we read your application and it seems like a good potential fit, we invite you to one of our interview days. We also call these preliminary assessment days. And you can see here the different interview days that we have remaining for this calendar year. Um, again, all of these interview days uh, are going to be for people to start in June. So even if you are accepted in March, um, you're not really going to start with us until our kickoff event in June. Um, is it to your advantage to get in early? It probably is, yes, um, because if we find that we accept people past our capacity to manage, then we're going to stop accepting applications. So <clears throat> I definitely would recommend starting the application process um, and, and going through the interview as quickly as possible. Um, but you'll see that we have dates in the Bay Area, in all four of our regions for March, April, and May. Um, if you go through our interview day and it still looks good and you're still interested, then we will send you an offer letter. And your job then is to sign and return the offer letter. Um, this letter outlines our expectations of participants and what we'll provide for people. And it's really a reiteration of, of what I've already told you. Um, we do again, want to make sure that people will take advantage of this, um, and we don't want to be um, putting resources, time, energy, and money towards folks who, um, you know, are, are iffy on whether or not they're going to be fully participating. So it, when the offer letter comes, that is time to, you know, say, yes, I, I'm going to make a two-year commitment. And these are the expectations. Uh, the program is two years, and depending on which track you choose, that looks a little bit differently. But we expect that people participate for the full two years. We expect that people attend the Summer Residential Institute, and this year that's held June 19th to 21st. We expect that people volunteer for at least one year, 
and then also participate and take advantage of our other training events. Uh, for credential track educators, we want to make sure people are uh, working towards their credential in a timely manner and that once they're done, they are pledging to work for at least two years. I think we've also said three, but here we'll say two years um, in teaching. We want to make sure this isn't just kind of a, uh, a flight of fancy, but people are really investing in, in becoming a teacher. And for the folks who decide, I don't want to be a full-time teacher, but I still want to be involved, we uh, expect that for at least two years they will volunteer with us. Okay, so I believe we are um, about at the end here. Um, so here's a slide. If you have other follow-up questions, um, here's how to get in touch with us. Uh, my number and email are here as well as Bethany's, and uh, the hope is that uh, you know we've sufficiently interested you to at least think about it. Um, if you have questions before you decide to apply, please ask. Um, we're available to talk with you further about your specific case, and um, we can help you out with any questions you might have. Um, I want to give Bethany a chance to give any kind of closing thoughts before we sign off and um, see if she has anything to add that I may have missed. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, I just want to thank everyone for being on the webinar today, um, and I hope that um, you will get in touch with us if you have any questions. I also hope that you will consider taking your professional experience and your um, your time in industry and the STEM fields and um, thinking about maybe using that to um, affect the lives of some of our students in California. So thanks so much. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions out there. It seems like the questions have uh, <coughs> run their course, but if there's any final questions, please uh, make them known now, because I think we're almost out of time. Um, I don't see anything popping up. Okay. Um, if you have any other questions, please get in touch with either Bethany or myself. Uh, we'd be happy to work with you on your specific case, and we really look forward to receiving your application and working with you to help make uh, students' math and science uh, experiences in school a lot better. So thank you so much for joining us today, um, and we hope to hear from you soon. Take care, everybody.